Uh, I'm an evolutionary biologist, and I work uh, in computational biology. So uh, in contrast to the other speakers this morning and to most other faculty members in our department, if you go to my lab, you won't see any benches, you won't see any test tubes, you won't see any uh, normal lab equipment that you would expect to see in a lab. You'll see a lot of desks and a lot of computers and hopefully a lot of smart people getting stuff done with those. Um, but yeah, I'm going to talk today a bit about uh, my background in biology and then also uh, about what I, more specifically, what we do with phylogenetics. So uh, I think everyone who gets into their field of interest comes, uh, develops an interest in that uh, field for different reasons. I grew up in Indiana, and so I spent a lot of my youth uh, sort of traipsing around woods and uh, catching, uh, as my parents put it, creepy crawlies. So any animal I could get my hands on that looked weird and fascinating. Uh, and then I spent uh, some time uh, late in high school and early in college working for the Department of Natural Resources in, uh, in Indiana. And I spent one summer working in fisheries uh, where we, we spent a lot of time doing, uh, does this have a pointer on it? Yeah, there we go. Uh, doing this thing called electro fishing where we, is that one? Okay. okay. Uh, where you go around in boats and you have uh, a generator on board and you hang electrodes in the water and you wait for fish to get shocked and then you scoop them up and see what's there. Uh, so that was a pretty, it was a pretty fun summer job. Uh, and it really uh, piqued my interest in going into biology as a, as a career. Uh, I did my undergraduate at Indiana University. As I said, I'm from Indiana. And I started out in the lab of, uh, of Mark Muscovich. Uh, and Mark's lab was interested in the molecular interactions that maintained, uh, or the molecular mechanisms, rather, that maintain interactions between species. And so I started out working with, uh, with this, uh, these sea anemones and their uh, algal uh, symbionts. So these algae actually live inside the cells of the anemones. And Mark was interested in understanding uh, how that sort of um, relationship is maintained. This becomes very important for processes like coral bleaching, uh, because what happens in bleaching is the corals uh, expel these algae. And so if we can understand something about the molecular mechanisms that maintain these interactions, maybe we can keep that from happening. Uh, so this is a great introduction to research at the college level. Mark uh, decided to move to Boston College partway through my undergraduate career, and so I had to switch labs. Uh, and I realized as I was doing this project that the questions I was most interested in were questions about origin and maintenance of these kinds of relationships. What were the forces that had brought this, uh, this close symbiotic relationship into being in the first place? So from there, I moved to the lab of Butch Brody. Uh, Butch worked on... Uh, it, his primary research projects were on snakes and newts and their interaction, and so this really appealed to me in terms of getting out of the field and catching things. Uh, unfortunately, it turns out he needed more help maintaining colonies of bugs in the lab, so it turned out to be not quite the same lab experience that I had anticipated, but it turned out to be a wonderful one, actually. So we studied uh, the maternal care behaviors of these burrower bugs. So it turns out burrower bugs, which are smaller than your thumbnail, have enough uh, innate uh, genetic uh, potential for maternal care to lay eggs, to provision those eggs, and to really be good parents. And so this provided a nice simple system for understanding the dynamics of that behavior uh, and the genetic control of that behavior. So I also worked closely with a PhD student in his lab named Anil Agarwal, uh, <clears throat> who's now a professor at the University of Toronto. Uh, we published a, a paper uh, that came out of my undergraduate research on the, this relationship between parents and offspring and how these behaviors are controlled. I realized as I was in Butch's lab that I was uh, primarily interested in the molecular genetic uh, aspect of evolution. So what can we learn from, uh, from the genetic information contained within organisms? And so I went to, moved on to graduate school at the University of Texas, and I really wanted to be a herpetologist. I tried as, as an undergraduate to be a herpetologist and got shunted off into working on bugs. So I tried again. I went into the lab of David Hillis, uh, who works in phylogenetics. Uh, and particularly phylogenetics of uh, reptiles and amphibians. So I was hoping to do some field-based project with uh, salamanders or snakes or lizards or frogs. But as I uh, spent time in David's lab, I realized that a lot of the questions I was really interested in understanding required uh, statistical and computational approaches to answer. Uh, so once we collect genetic information from any given organism, uh, we want to ultimately learn something about its evolutionary history. But to do that, you have to, uh, you have, to have appropriate statistical methods, 
and you have to have appropriate computational techniques to actually draw those inferences. And it turns out, as I think you'll see as I, as I go on, in evolutionary biology, and in particular um, uh, the molecular aspects of evolutionary biology, we are, this is, uh, the collection of data is no longer the limiting step. We're experiencing a data flood. And so some of the most interesting questions now are not how do we get this data and from where do we get this data, but what do we do with it? How do we interpret it? How do we understand it? And so that requires uh, improvements at these two steps in the process. And so I started working in computational methods. And so in particular, um, I started working on Bayesian statistical methods to infer phylogeny. So a phylogeny is a depiction of the evolutionary relationships between species or organisms. And we do this in a Bayesian, what we call a Bayesian framework. And the only thing you really need to understand about that for now is that we're interested in this quantity here, which is the probability that any given phylogenetic tree gave rise to the data that we've observed. And so that we represent the data, the sequence data that we've collected with these, these little matrices. Uh, and so this is, this is where I got my interest in computational biology, computational evolutionary biology. Now it might seem a little disappointing for someone who is really interested in getting out into the field to, uh, to end up working on computational methods and be sitting at a desk all day. But one of the beautiful things about working on these kinds of methods is that they're applicable to a whole host of different biological systems. And so as a graduate student, I collaborated a lot with friends who were uh, working on more empirically focused projects. Uh, and one, just to give you one example, one cool project that came out of this work, uh, in collaboration with a friend of mine uh, who's also in graduate school at the University of Texas named Christian Rabeling, he found this, uh, this crazy ant in the Amazon when he was out collecting. This, it's the only individual of this species that has ever been found, uh, or that, that is still in existence, rather, in a collection. And it looks totally different than any other ant on Earth. And so Christian was interested in understanding more specifically the evolutionary history of this ant. And so he came to me. Uh, he collected sequence data. We applied the kinds of phylogenetic methods that I work on to try and figure out where this ant went in the overall ant tree of life. And it turns out that this ant uh, is the, essentially the uh, most distantly related living ant on Earth today. So, uh, so it's the, this is all other living ants, and this is related groups like wasps and things like that. Uh, and Martialis, this new ant that he described, falls out right here. So it's, it's a completely uh, sort of exotic and unique uh, evolutionary entity. Uh, and it's so different than all other ants on Earth that it, it's, uh, it was dubbed the ant from Mars. And so when we described this in 2008, it got a lot of attention in the popular press, I think mostly because of the name Christian had chosen to give into it. But, um, but even though I work on computational approaches, there's still a lot of very interesting sort of empirical questions that we can answer with these approaches. So uh, after graduate school at Texas, I went on to do a postdoc at uh, University of California, Berkeley, funded by the National Science Foundation very generously. And the, the basic question that I asked uh, while I was a postdoc was, um, if we're interested in inferring phylogenies, traditionally phylogenies have been inferred from data sets like this. So maybe we've collected data from a single gene across a range of species. So in these matrices, each row represents a different species, and each column represents a different site in the genome that we've sequenced for that species. And so traditionally we had sort of smallish data sets like this, but now, say in the last five years, we're able to sequence entire genomes very cheaply and very fast. And so how do we go about inferring phylogenies from data sets that are more like this. So we've sampled a whole bunch of genes from all across the genome. Uh, and how do, we, uh, how do we handle that scale of data? What new things can we learn when we look across an entire genome as opposed to a single gene? So, uh, so that's a bit about my background. Um, as, you, as you might be able to tell, most of my work now is focused on uh, evolutionary history as an organizing framework. So in other <laughs> words, we're interested in understanding the overall tree of life. Uh, this, was, this has been a uh, sort of a goal of biologists ever since Darwin. In fact, he devoted the only picture in The Origin of Species to his earliest depiction of what the tree of life might look like, or the branching process that, uh, by which new species form. Now you can see the scale at which we think about the tree of life now has gotten much bigger. So this is a sort of a proof of principle tree built by a friend of mine in grad school. Um, where he sampled uh, available genetic sequences from an online genetic database and built a tree. And this, uh, this sort of proof of principle tree includes about 3,000 species. That's, those are the number of species we had data available for at the time. Now, overall, there are probably something around 9 million uh, species that exist on Earth. 
So if the, spe uh, the tree containing 3,000 species is this big, you can imagine how big the overall tree of life is containing 9 million species. Uh, so it's a really big computational problem uh, that we're trying to address here. Uh, and to just put it in sort of numerical terms, we can think about the number of different possible phylogenies that relate any, any number of uh, species or any number of uh, organisms. So we have that number here, the number of taxa, we call it, from 1 to 50. Uh, and we have two different kinds of trees, unrooted and rooted phylogenetic trees. The only difference between these are that rooted trees contain uh, an extra bit of information about what the oldest part of that tree is, what we call the root of the tree. Uh, now you can see when we have a small number of species in our tree, the number of possible phylogenies is pretty small, from 1 to, say, 15. But the number gets big very, very fast as we add species to this tree. Until by the time we're up to about 50 species, there are over 10 to the 76th possible phylogenetic trees that could relate those species. Uh, and uh, someone pointed out that this is roughly equivalent to the number of fundamental particles in the universe. Uh, so this is, again, just putting a, a number on just how big this problem is. This is only 50 taxa. We're interested in trees of, say, 9 million taxa. So phylogeny forms a central sort of position in biological understanding. Uh, so what we do in my lab is we, uh, we're interested in taking sequence data, and we're interested in developing better statistical models that allow us to get better estimates of phylogenetic histories. But in the process, we can also use this, these estimates of histories to understand something about how evolution has happened uh, at the gene or genomic scale. So, which genes have uh, evolved under the effects of natural selection versus random processes? How does the size of genomes change? That sort of thing. Uh, how do the relative rates of evolution in different genes change? Uh, but we also, the, one of the most important aspects of phylogenies is that they provide sort of a historical framework to understand organismal uh, biology or to do comparative biology. So whenever we're interested in comparing multiple species to try and understand how evolution has happened, we have to have a historical context in which to put this. Um, and so, so, yeah, phylogenies are really sort of central to biological studies today in a range of fields, both, both in evolutionary biology as a basic discipline, but also a lot of applied disciplines like forensics, agriculture, conservation, medicine, uh, things like that. You can get a sense of how popular phylogenetic approaches have become. This is the number of publications in thousands per year that, that use some sort of phylogenetic method or or say phylogeny in the title or keywords of a paper. And you can see sort of that number was pretty low in the 70s and 80s, uh, but right around the early 90s, it really started to take off. And this had a lot to do with the advent of PCR, the uh, availability of fast desktop computing, and also the availability of software that could do these kinds of phylogenetic inferences. And so this number has risen extremely quickly. Uh, this data is a few months old now. But you can see every year there are over 12,000 papers published in the literature that use phylogenetics. And this is probably a, a very conservative estimate because this is only papers that actually say so in their title or keywords. So the kinds of methods that we use here uh, get applied all over the place uh, in terms of, of biological questions. Now I'm going to run through uh, just a few projects that my lab is currently working on. Uh, so one of those, uh, one of those questions uh, has to do with the phylogenetic placement of turtles. Now, ironically, almost everyone is surprised when I tell them this, but we really don't have a good idea where turtles go in the tree of life. We know that they're vertebrates, we know that they're reptiles, but we don't actually know which group uh, among, say, tetrapods they're most closely related to. So this is a phylogenetic tree showing mammals uh, diverging first over here. And we have this branch that goes over here and gives rise to, this is a tuatara. It's uh, closely related to lizards, although it's not actually a lizard. And we have this group here, which is lizards and snakes are nested within lizards. And then we have uh, over here crocodilians and birds. And it turns out uh, turtles can go at least, uh, based on different lines of evidence, people have suggested that turtles go in at least five different places on this tree, which is kind of astounding considering uh, how long people have been studying turtles. Um, they, they might go all the way down here at the base. They might be sister to what we call lepidosaurs, so tuataras, lizards, and snakes. They might be sister to archosaurs, which are crocodilians and birds, or they might be sister to crocodilians or sister to birds. And so uh, in the last few years, 
we, the, as I mentioned before, the, the rate at which we can gather genomic data has increased really fast. And so just in the past year, we've gotten the first turtle genome sequence that we can now leverage to try and understand where turtles go in the tree of life. Uh, so we sequenced the genome of the painted turtle, Chrysomys picta. Uh, and there are now several other genomes from these major groups of vertebrates that we can compare the, the turtle genome to. So we're, uh, we've, we've uh, pulled out 3,400 genes, uh, roughly, from, uh, from all of these genomes, so turtle, chicken, zebra finch, alligator, duck-billed platypus, anoles, humans, and Burmese pythons. And so we're using these as representative taxa for these big groups to try and understand where turtles go. This, this scale of analysis, I should point out, was totally infeasible uh, just a handful of years ago. So this field is changing extremely rapidly. Uh, so these are just uh, some preliminary results we've gotten. You guys are on the cutting edge. I just got these results back a couple of days ago. Uh, so each color represents a different hypothesized placement of turtles in the tree of life. Uh, and on the x-axis here, we have how strongly, um, uh, how many genes support that placement. So over here we have strong support for the placement. And over here, we have strong support against the replacement. And then on the x-axis here, we just have the number of genes that are giving us that signal. And so you can see there's really mixed messages here, so to speak. So if we look across all these genes, we have at least some subset of genes that are strongly supporting every hypothesized placement of turtles in the tree of life. Uh, but every hypothesized placement is also strongly rejected by many genes in our alignment. And so this is where the challenge of developing better statistical methods comes into play. Because we have to be able to somehow look through this, this signal uh, and ask what, uh, what's the sort of dominant signal here, which, uh, which genes are giving us the most reliable answers. Uh, if we just tally, so if we just look at the number of genes here that are supporting each possible placement, and then we go back to our hypotheses in the, in the tree, we can see that uh, this placement and this placement are roughly equally popular among the genes that we've looked at. This placement of turtles next to birds uh, is sort of second most popular, and then things uh, taper off as we look at these placements. So it's sort of indicating, uh, perhaps, that turtles diverge somewhere close to the divergence of crocodilians and birds. And that's why we see this variation in genes supporting each of the, these three possible placements. Um, but there's some there's some possibility that the statistical methods we're using uh, simply aren't appropriate for all the data that we're putting into our analysis. So we like to think that we can gather a bunch of data, throw it into a computer, and we'll get an answer out. But it turns out the answers we get out vary in their quality. Uh, I'm going to use the analogy here of, uh, of perhaps um, someone like the director of the CIA who has uh, a bunch of uh, spies out in the field, and he's getting intelligence back from those spies. He's learning something about some in, uh, situation he's interested in based on that information. Uh, but those spies might tell him different things, but uh, certain sources of information might have ulterior motives, and therefore uh, that person might trust certain sources of information over others. Uh, and so that's sort of the, the situation we're in here with this phylogenomic approach, is that we're getting information from a lot of different genes. But some of those genes, due to the way that they've evolved, are giving us misleading phylogenetic signal. And so what we'd like to be able to do is to have some way of going through all of these genes uh, and essentially filtering out the ones that are misleading us. So it, it can't be true that all five of those placements of turtles in the tree of life are correct. And so uh, presumably some of the information we're getting back from some of the genes in our genome uh, is not accurate. And so. Our lab is currently working on statistical approaches to do this kind of filtering, uh, to do this kind of computation. And I call this bottom-up phylogenomics. So we take the data, and then we assess, essentially, the reliability of the answer we're getting from each bit of data that we're using, each gene. Now I'm going to uh, close with uh, a second example of a project uh, that's ongoing in my lab. Um, so we often think about evolutionary history in terms of uh, very long time spans. So when we're talking about turtles and the placement in the overall vertebrate tree of life, we're talking about hundreds of millions of years. But it turns out a lot of things evolve very, very fast. And they evolve so fast that we can reconstruct uh, phylogenies for things uh, over the course of days, weeks, months, and years. Uh, and so the, the kinds of things that tend to evolve that quickly are usually pathogens. So things like, say, HIV, flu, uh, staphylococcus, um, 
thing, and in many cases, obviously, in these three cases, there are things that uh, adversely affect humans. And so we're interested in understanding how they're transmitted and what their evolutionary dynamics are. Now, one interesting uh, way we can leverage this rapid evolution uh, with HIV is to actually do molecular forensics. And so what I mean by that is that um, there are cases, there are situations in which uh, an individual has been uh, knowingly, accused of knowingly or negligently infecting other people with a disease, and in particular with HIV. And so uh, there have been a handful of such cases around the U.S. in recent years. Uh, I worked on this case uh, from Texas from a few years ago where this gentleman was accused of, uh, of infecting these women with HIV, uh, where he lied about his HIV status when he had a relationship with them. Uh, but the, the prosecution was interested in knowing whether or not there was any way to establish a link uh, between the HIV in, um, in the suspect and in the potential victims. HIV evolves so fast that we can't simply compare the genomes of HIV in one person to another because they've changed already, so they're already different. So rather than doing sort of that kind of DNA fingerprinting approach, we have to actually reconstruct their historical relationships. And so we can think about what kind of information that might give us by uh, this sort of thought experiment, where if we have HIV circulating in some individual prior to a transmission event, uh, we have a variety of different lineages, and they're related by some phy phylogenetic tree already, those lineages are. Uh, so this is prior to a transmission event. At some point, perhaps one of these lineages is, um, is transmitted to another individual. It turns out with HIV, uh, in most cases of transmission, it's a single, uh, single viral lineage that gives rise to an infection in another person. So it undergoes a strong genetic bottleneck at, uh, bottleneck at transmission. So uh, we have one lineage going on to a, a recipient. We then have uh, diversification within that recipient. This tree should still be connected down here. I don't know what happened there. Uh, we have some extinction of lineages uh, within our original source individual. The immune system and drug therapies are going to drive some lineages out, out of the body. So uh, some lineages have continued on, some have gone extinct, and, and some have diversified in our recipient. Now you'll notice we have a particular phylogenetic pattern at this point in time, just after a transmission event. We have uh, the, the lineages within the recipient individual are nested within the overall diversity of lineages from our source individual. And so this gives us information about the direction of transmission of HIV. Uh, but if, we, if enough time passes after a transmission event, uh, we're going to have a lot of extinction events in the source, and eventually we're going to lose this sort of nesting relationship. There should also be an X right there. Uh, so all the, now all of the lineages within the source are most closely related to one another and all the lineages within the recipient are most closely related to one another. So we've sort of lost the signal of the direction of transmission. But there's a window in time just after transmission when we can actually learn about this. And so we can think about three different, if we collect sequence data for HIV from, um, from two individuals who are uh, part of a transmission chain, and then some other control individuals that also have HIV, uh, perhaps in the same local community, uh, we can think about three different possible relationships of the HIV uh, from these two, two individuals. Um, if the infections are totally unrelated to one another, the, the sequences from person one and person two shouldn't uh, group together on our phylogenetic tree. They should group with outgroup sequences. If uh, the transmission event happened a long time ago or they both uh, received HIV from a third source, we should expect to see this kind of phylogenetic pattern where they're most closely related to one another, but there's no nesting relationship of one within the other. However, if there's been a recent transmission event, not only should they be closely related to one another, but as we pointed out earlier, the recipient sequences should be nested within the source sequences. And so in this case, we were given blood samples from eight individuals involved in this case. We didn't know the identity of any of these individuals at the outset of our study. Uh, and when we pulled out 20, actually 20 uh, clones of HIV from each individual uh, and sequenced them and then compared the gene sequences from those individuals and built a phylogenetic tree. We did this for two different genes, just for the sake of time. I'm only going to show you one. This is the data from the reverse transcriptase gene. Um, and here I've color-coded all of the sequences that we've uh, taken from a given individual. So, and each individual has a number. Uh, so these are all the sequences from individual 6, from individual 7, 5, 3, 4, 2, 8. But you'll notice the sequences from 1 are scattered throughout our tree. 
okay? And our outgroup sequences are all, the, uh, all of our case samples form one closely related group to the exclusion of our outgroups. So we had two patterns that we were looking for, right? First, we were looking to see whether or not our case samples were most closely related to one another, and indeed they are. So that suggests there's at least some common source for these infections. And secondly, there is para, what we call paraphyly of, of the sequences from one individual. So in other words, the sequences from all these recipient individuals are nested within the diversity of sequences from this individual, individual one. Um, and we saw a very similar pattern at the other gene that we sequenced uh, for the study, the envelope gene, which sits on the outside of HIV and interacts with the immune system. Uh, and so this suggested to us that, that these were uh, uh, the result of, of a, a single sort of transmission cluster, and that individual one was the source of infections in the other individuals. And so we submitted our uh, findings to, uh, to the prosecutor who then revealed at trial that, in fact, individual one was the defendant in the case. So it did seem to corroborate the external evidence. And actually, I forgot to point this out, but interestingly enough, uh, not, only, uh, not only was individual one uh, the, the suspect, but they'd had a relationship with individual eight earliest in time, uh, and then a relationship with, I think, individual six just after that. So the timing of branching events on this tree also match the timing of relationships of the source with the potential recipients. So that, that led us to believe that, in fact, we're, we're getting a lot of useful forensic information out of these kinds of analyses. But there's a lot of open questions with this kind of uh, study, like how does signal vary across genes within the HIV genome? Uh, we've ignored some evolutionary processes for the sake of, of being able to do the computations at first. So we've ignored uh, things like recombination and convergent evolution. Um, and we also don't exactly know how long that, that paraphyletic signal, that nesting signal, is maintained after a transmission event. So we're investigating all these questions now. We've, we've gotten some funding from the National Institute of Justice. I never expected to get funding for my research from the National Institute of Justice, but uh, we're going back and we're resequencing uh, the whole genomes of these HIV lineages and, and addressing some of these questions. Um, so I'm very excited to see where this goes in the future. Uh, and I want to just close with a plug. At least in biology, I think there, uh, at least when I was uh, majoring in biology, um, I had very little exposure to the idea of merging statistics in biology or computation in biology. And I think this is, uh, this is um, in many ways, many of the major discoveries that are waiting to happen in the next few years are going to come about as a result of computational approaches to biology. And so I would encourage you, if you have a chance, Take a class in computer science, take a class in statistics, think about how you might integrate computational approaches into your work. Even if you're not in biology, whatever field you're in, um, uh, I think it will, you'll find that it will benefit you a lot in the long run. So thanks for your time, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Questions? I was wondering what kind of technology you use to like see the genes and like compare them. I have no idea. Oh right, so um, so I yeah I I must admit that my personal experience with with uh, genome sequencing is pretty minimal because normally I get data from people I collaborate with, but um, the way that people sequence genes and sequence genomes has changed radically over the last say five years. Um, and so now there are these uh, techniques where we essentially take a genome or we isolate the DNA from a given biological sample, some tissue sample. Uh, we isolate the DNA and we break it up into relatively small fragments. And then uh, we spread that, those fragments essentially out on a chip. And then we can simultaneously sequence each of those small fragments uh, all across this chip. So we're sequencing hundreds of thousands of fragments simultaneously. And so by doing it, and uh, this is sort of sequencing in parallel, we call it. And so by doing all this in parallel, we can get a massive amount of data in a short amount of time. And so we can, uh, we can sequence a whole genome um, in a matter now of a day or a few days. Whereas before, when we were doing it gene by gene, like the original, uh, sequencing the human genome as part of the Human Genome Project took years to do. Um, but yeah, there's, there's a lot of very uh, fancy and cool uh, chemistry that goes on in actually getting those sequences. Yeah. 
other questions? Um, at what length of time did those infections occur over, like, did it occur over five years or ten years? Or? From the HIV study? Yeah, so the earliest, so um, individual eight, I think, who was the earliest diverging lineage uh, here, um, I believe that relationship was about 10 years before we took the, the samples for our study. Um, and then the next, I want to say the next earliest diverging one was on the order of six or seven years. But then uh, many of these were on the order of, uh, of only a, a few months or a year or two prior to taking the samples. So that seems to be, at least uh, from this data, that seems to be the window of opportunity we have. Right? So we can see this sort of paraphyletic relationship on the order of a few years. And it also depends on the rate of evolution of the gene that we're looking at. So reverse transcriptase evolves relatively slowly, so we see the signal for longer. Uh, the envelope gene, which I, whose data I didn't show today, uh, evolves much faster, and so we tend to lose that signal more quickly. Yeah. Oh, I have another question. Um, do you have any recommendations as to which computer languages would be most useful or like are more commonly used or? Yeah, it depends a bit on what you want to do. Um, but uh, for someone who's just getting into programming, if you don't have any background in it, um, I would recommend Python. It's a relatively easy language to understand. Uh, and it requires a lot less syntax to write uh, pieces of software. So in other words, if you have uh, some task you want to take care of and you don't, you're probably not going to be doing this, you know, uh, hundreds of thousands of times. Uh, just you want to get this thing done once uh, quickly. Uh, Python, you can write scripts, you can write programs very fast. Um, and it's relatively easy to read and to understand. Um, once you understand the structure of a program, like in Python, you can then easily sort of build up to more complex languages like C++ or Java. Yeah. Um, I had a question about the turtles. And uh, you said in your data you're trying to isolate pieces of um, data that are misleading or um, I was just wondering how you go about deciding which pieces are misleading in your statistical model and things like that. Yeah, we, I sort of glossed over that. Um, uh, basically, in a nutshell, what we do, so we have, we develop what we call a stochastic model. It's a probabilistic model for how DNA sequences change over time. Now, what we can do is we, not only can we say, what's the probability of this data I've already observed, if I assume this model, but we can simulate data sets using that model. And so the technique, the general approach that we're using is to, uh, is to take the model and we simulate a whole bunch of data sets. And then we compare those data sets in some way to the data we've collected. And then we ask, uh, does the data we've simulated look like the data we've collected? If it does, that means our model is probably capturing the important features of evolution. Um, and so maybe the results we're getting back are trustworthy. However if, there, however, if there's some strong difference in the way that our simulated data sets appear relative to our, our empirical data, then we should maybe be suspicious. Uh, so it involves, yeah, sort of massive simulations. Yeah. I have another question. Um, you, kind of about the HIV thing, how you showed how the virus evolved over 10 years. Can you also create a predictive model, like for flu vaccines or something like that? Uh, yeah, uh, Prediction has been uh, notoriously difficult relative to inferring past history, but there have been uses of phylogenetic approaches to, uh, yeah, to, make, to make predictions about uh, flu pandemics. So in other words, which strain, if I can only make a vaccine for one or a small number of strains, which strain should I focus on? And so you can build uh, the same kinds of trees for the circulating flu strains in a given year, and it turns out that whichever branch is longest in that tree, so in other, in other words, whichever flu strain has undergone the most evolution within that year, tends, it has a higher probability of being the strain that then produces a pandemic in the following year. So when, um, when companies are deciding which vaccines to make, they'll actually build trees of flu for a given year. They pick out the ones that have evolved the most within that year, and then they design um, vaccines or, towards those strains. Um, but yeah, that's, uh, that has been much more difficult to, to make accurate predictions rather than to reconstruct sort of known histories. Yeah. Other questions? <clears throat> 
Health Science Center in Shreveport. Any any questions? Very quiet bunch. Health Science Center in New Orleans. Any questions? Just jump in, jump right on in if you do. Um, Children's Hospital. The two of you there. Any questions? All right. Thank you. Thank you.